In this lecture, we'll be discussing Muhammad Shukri's For Bread Alone. Muhammad Shukri is, is a very interesting writer from Morocco. His, uh, his memoir, in fact, For Bread Alone, tells the story of his childhood, his uh, coming into manhood from very difficult circumstances that he grew up in in Morocco. It's, it's a very difficult novel to read, not because it's not clear, it's very clear, but because of some of the very disturbing situations, images that uh, occur in the novel from the experiences that Mohammed Shukri had as a child. So he overcame great adversity as a child. He was illiterate. He didn't learn to uh, write or read until he became an adult while imprisoned. And uh, and so as such, uh, the work that he did uh, is even today throughout Morocco, in Morocco and throughout the Islamic world more generally is regarded as scandalous and is still not very welcome. It's censored in some places uh, because he speaks truths that many would rather not hear, or he, he addresses topics that are not really welcome very much in this context. Uh, so uh, nonetheless, uh, his novel For Bread Alone, or his memoir, his first person narrative, however one wants to describe it, has been translated. I think it's almost 30 languages now that it's been translated in many, many different languages. So it's had an enormous uh, influence throughout the world, although still in Morocco, you know, it's, 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 you know, it remains a very controversial text. And, uh, and so therefore I think, uh, that alone should, you know, really tell us something. Anytime one encounters censorship, it tells us that there's something, you know, at work. And so this novel has been censored. It's considered to be, you know, uh, dealing with themes that are unwelcomed, unwanted, uh, and yet they, they, they tell us a great deal about contemporary uh, Maghribian Islamic society. Now, Shukri was Berber. He came from a very humble uh, origin. And, uh, and he also, uh, as he became uh, into adulthood and as, as he, uh, you know, became a writer, a very well-known writer, he, uh, he, he came to know many of the most important writers in the English language and French as well in the 20th century who came to Tangier, lived in Tangier as expatriates. Now, of course, Paul Bowles is foremost among those, Jane Bowles as well, Tennessee Williams, Truman Capote, uh, William S. Burroughs, Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg. There were many American writers who came to Morocco, lived in Morocco uh, for a number of years, and Shukri associated with many of them. And, uh, and, and, and he foremost um, among them was, again, Paul Bowles. And Bowles was the translator of this text, as we're going to uh, discuss. So let's, let's go straight into it. Now, there, there you can see Shukri when he was in his older years. He died in 2003. He lived from 1935 to 2003. For Bread Alone is his best known work, and, and, and rightfully so, because of the themes that it deals with and the questions that it raises. The Tent is also very interesting. This is a collection of short stories published in 1985. If you're, uh, if, you, if you're a student of literature, uh, particularly American literature, in Tangier is an indispensable work. Now, he wrote this from over a period of years, from 1993 to 2009. And here he, he sort of turns the tables on American writers. Now, for instance, Bowles wrote a lot of uh, novels and short stories about Moroccan people. Uh, William S. Burroughs, his best known novel is Naked Lunch, which is set in Tangier. And so um, here we find a Moroccan writer writing about Americans. And so really, you know, if you read Bowles and you read Burroughs, you really need to read Shukri as well to get a sense of what a Moroccan Berber perspective is on these uh, American expatriate writers living in Tangier. And so I very much recommend this work, but it's more of a literary uh, historical document, whereas For Bread Alone uh, is, is a buildings roman or novel social formation that tells the story 
of this enormously difficult um, childhood that he lived through and how he, uh, how he came to maturity and uh, freed himself from many of the, from the situation of poverty and hardship that he had experienced as a child. Now, Bowles, uh, Bowles is the translator of this novel, and um, it, it is an anomaly in terms of what the kinds of translations that Bowles normally, uh, you know, produced. Uh, most of the time, like say, for instance, with Muhammad Mabret, he would uh, he would record, take oral storytelling of of Moroccans and uh, interlocutors whom he translated. He would record the stories that they told him, and then he would translate them into English from the Maghrebi, uh, which is an uh, which is a Moroccan dialect of Arabic. Now. He did not, however, speak classical Arabic. He was not uh, steeped in that. And so this text is different because, um, because Muhammad Shukri wrote it himself after you know, sort of pulling himself out of a situation of illiteracy and as an adult learning how to read and write. Uh, Shukri wrote the text himself in classical Arabic, but Bowles did not speak classical Arabic. And so... Uh, 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 so, so Shukri would have to translate it to him, you know, in in uh, in Maghrebi, in in French, and so on. And so, from this, then they together produce this translation. So, I, I, but but Bowles' best known translations, with the exception of this one, are more oral. He comes from a more oral storytelling translation perspective. Now, he's Bowles is very well known as a composer, also of classical music. But uh, his Sheltering Sky, his text, The Sheltering Sky, is obviously his most important novel. Bertolucci made a film version of this. Some of his short stories are wonderful. Some are not as strong as others, but there are some very strong stories in his collected stories. And he was a gifted short story writer. Um, Their Heads Are Green is about his collection of uh music and it, this is a non-fictional work so he wrote many works and and they're they're very interesting and he's very much worth reading as a novelist and as a short story and non-fiction writer however you know arguably it was his work in translation that that he'll be remembered for because many of the texts that he produced as a translator uh, gave us insight into this sort of subaltern uh, Moroccan experience that we would not have if, if Bowles had not done this work for us. Now, Jane Bowles, Paul Bowles' wife, was not really very enthusiastic about his work as a translator. She, she urged him to just write his own stories as well, but, but uh, Paul Bowles persevered with his work in translation, particularly after Jane Bowles got ill. And uh, he, he could, this was something that he could do that was easier for him to do, given the difficult circumstances that he was living through at the time of Jane's Bull's uh, illness. And so he came into contact with Muhammad Shukri. He translated this text for us. So Bulls is important not only as a writer of fiction, uh, but in nonfiction, but also as a translator. And so uh, we're going to look at some of the, these questions of, of translation that, that make, as I said, this is an anomaly. We'll, we'll explore why as we get further into it. Now, here, here's what Bull says in the, in the preface to this text. He says, because I have translated several books from the Arabic, I want to make a clear differentiation between the earlier volumes that he's translated and the present work. This is Shukri's work. The other books that he translated were spoken onto tape, and the words were in the colloquial Arabic called Maghrebi. For bread alone is a manuscript written in classical Arabic, a language I do not know, Bol says. The author, Muhammad Shukri, had to reduce it first to Moroccan Arabic for me. Then we used Spanish and French for ascertaining shades of meaning. Though exact, the translation is far from literal. So this is one of the, I think one of the really interesting things about this text, you know, if you're looking at it from the perspective of translation, the, the way that it came to be produced in English is, you know, is from an American author and an American translator who does not speak classical Arabic, does speak the, the language of the street spoken in Morocco, 
uh, but th- that is so different that, uh, you know, he doesn't, you know, he, he's clueless when it comes to classical Arabic. So, uh, so Shukri wrote it in classical Arabic, but he dictated it, his, you know, and so they, you know, they collaborated, they worked together to produce the document that we have, which is for bread alone. Now, because Bowles is, was such a gifted writer, his translations are wonderful. I mean, if you, if you, you know, as, as, if you're looking at it from a literary perspective, Bowles does an amazing job. However, you know, that, that doesn't mean that he's, uh, you know, uh, exempt from criticism. You know, some people, you know, criticize some of the liberties that they perceive that he may have taken with the original text. Uh, but Bowles is, is working as a literary author who is doing the work of translation, and he does a very fine job with this particular text. And so, uh, you know, as, as readers of, of American English especially, we have every reason to, uh, to appreciate this novel and, and the translation work that Bowles has done for us. Now, Mohammed uh, Mabret is, was born in 1936. He's still alive, and he was the, the, uh, the Maghrebian Moroccan uh, oral storyteller that Bowles did the most collaboration work, and the two of them together produced several novels and short stories and other works that uh, that Mabret would uh, would orally recount to Bowles, and then Bowles would uh, would would translate it into a very elegant English. But again, uh, the the same is true of Mabret as Shukri, that that from the Moroccan perspective, the literature that Bowles produced in working with Moroccan uh, you know, poets and authors was not particularly welcomed in the local context because it brought to light uh, an, a storytelling traditions that were very idiosyncratic to Morocco and that, uh, you know, that, that many were, you know, Moroccans might have been worried about how it presented Morocco in, in a negative light. Um, and so that's, that's, you know, the context. We have to think about the history of the reception of these texts. And, and Mabret's texts, for instance, have been, due to the translations of Bowles, have been more widely read, uh, arguably, outside of Morocco than inside of Morocco. And here's, uh, here is what, uh, uh, what, uh, what Shukri says about this, you know, and Shukri was, you know, Shukri, if you read his book in Tangier, again, as I said, it's, it gives us an insight into Moroccan perspectives on, or the, the Shukri's perspective in any case, who was a Berber Moroccan man uh, on Bowles. And so we get, I think it's really important because we don't just get Bowles describing uh, Berber Moroccan people. Here we get a Berber Moroccan man describing Bowles. And he's, Shukri was a little bit critical as we're going to see of, uh, of, of how Bowles, of, you know, translated the work of Mabret. In this case, he says, with the passing of time, Paul's distinct style began to be influenced by his translations from Mag- uh, Moroccan Arabic. This is, in other words, Paul's, uh, Paul Bowles' own literature was influenced by his encounter. And remember, he lived in Tangier for, you know, almost all of his adult life. This is particularly noticeable in the tales that one could label Moroccan. Some of Mabret's Moroccan friends who had listened to this tape recordings and compared them to the printed translations that Bowles had made of them told him, Mabret that is, that Bowles hadn't been very faithful to his adaptations. This made Mabret livid with rage. The strange thing is that Paul erased all the copies of his recordings with Mabret. So Shukri's you know, very, you know, he's, he's critical of the fact that Bowles erased the oral copies of the recordings, you know, so that nobody, nobody now is able to know what Mabret actually said. We get Mabret mediated to us through the translations of Bowles. This is not the case with Shukri because with Shukri there, this text was produced, was written. It was a written text, not an oral text. Uh, it was written in classical Arabic, and so we can compare the classical Arabic original with the translation that Bowles created uh, through his conversations with Shukri and, and Shukri's, uh, you know, they're using uh, Maghrebi, French, and Spanish to create the text that actually came to be created. So it's there's a very interesting history behind 
the production of this text. Now, uh, but I, as I said, Bowles translated far more works by Mohammed Mabret than he did of Shukri. And, uh, and so I would urge you to go out and look at some of these. My, my personal favorite is The Limb, and I think it's just a wonderful uh, novel that the two of them produced together. But there are, other, there are plenty of other works, and they're, they're very enjoyable, they're very readable, and they, they were created through this collaborative process of oral st storytelling and then translation that led to the production of these novels. And, you know, who knows, in time it may be that uh, possibly with the exception of a few short stories in The Sheltering Sky, that, that one is going to look back and see these works of translation that Bowles did as being among his most significant achievements. Now, I want to just, as we go, before we go into Shukri's text itself, I want to look at some uh, comparative translations of what, on the one hand, would be a more literal translation from the Arabic, and then what Bowles did with this, just to give us a sense of the complexity of the process involved. And here's, here's how Bowles translated this from this complex process of discussion with Shukri, he came up with this translation. He says, one afternoon I could not stop crying. I, in this case, Shukri, I was hungry. I had sucked my fingers so much that the idea of doing it again made me sick to my stomach. My mother kept telling me, be quiet. Tomorrow we're leaving for Tangier. There's all the bread you want there. You won't be crying for bread anymore once we get to Tangier. So now if you look at the, though, the original Arabic that, that was the written version that Shukri himself produced, this would give us a better sense of how it might read in Arabic. So one afternoon, I cannot stop crying. I feel pain from hunger. I suck my fingers again and again. I vomit, but only threads of saliva come out of my mouth. My mother tells me once in a while, be quiet. We're leaving from Tangier. So you can see by, by contrasting these two different translations, you can see that Bowles does indeed take some liberties, but they're the liberties that are intended to make the text more readable to his perceived uh, reading audience. And so um, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to suggest that Bowles' translation is not faithful to Shukri's. I think arguably it is faithful, but it's not, uh, it's not identical to what, to what a say, literal interpretation would be doesn't mean that it doesn't have value. Here's another uh, comparison that we can look at. Here's Bowles. He says, the neighbor, he's, he's translating Shukri here. The neighbors had to break the bolt on our front door in order to deliver me and my mother from the blows of his, and this is his father's uh, military belt. My body was covered with bleeding welts, and one of her eyes, his mother's eyes, was swollen shut. It was many nights before I could find a comfortable position to sleep in. I long to be able to sleep in the air. My wounds hurt, my body, my bones ached, and I can feel the fever burning in my head. And here's the more literal Arabic. Two neighbors broke the bolt on our, door, our house's door to rescue me and my mother. He, my father, was battering us with his military belt. My whole body is covered with blood. My mother's eyes, my mother's eye is swollen. It was many nights before I found a way to sleep. I wished I could sleep in the air. Now, again, let's let's remember there's no such thing as a as literally as a correct interpretation or a correct translation. That they're both legitimate interpretations. One is more literal. One perhaps does take some liberties with the text, but without ceasing to remain faithful to the original text. But that's a distinction worth bearing in mind as we consider the translation that Bowles produced with the collaboration of Shukri. And here's what Bowles says about Muhammad Shukri at the beginning of this text. Bowles says, It has been my experience that the illiterate, not having learned to classify what goes into his memory, remembers everything. Total recall is like perfect pitch. It means nothing in itself, but it can be extremely helpful to the writer who uses it professionally. It seems almost a stroke of good luck that Shukri's encounter with the written word should have come so late. For by then his habits of thought were already fully formed. The educative process did not modify them. As a writer then, he is an, in an enviable position, even though he paid a high price for it in suffering. 
So this is a really interesting observation. And I think, you know, there's, there's some truth to this is that, that people who are not literate tend to have a, a better memory than those who are literate because they have no choice but to, but to remember rather than to store knowledge, let's say, in, in an external sense, you know, outside of, of their body in, in written texts. And so, you know, Shukri has this gift, Bowles notes, that he himself does not have of being able to have you know, total recall. Well, so he's got a wonderful memory, but then he did learn to write. He learned to write, you know, later, read and write later in life when he was imprisoned. I think he was about 19 at the time that he started to learn. And so he, he became a writer, but a writer who has the memory, the, the, the total memory of a person who is not literate. And so, uh, you know, this is, this is an interesting, I think, observation that Bowles makes. This is one of the reasons that he finds him to be such a gifted writer. Now, um, I th there's a few questions I would raise here. If we think, if we think about this in literary terms, um, you know, one question we might ask is bread is for bread alone, a testimonial narrative test, the testimonial or the testimonial is a very prominent genre that was uh, especially in uh, Latin America emanating out of Cuba. It was uh, very influential during the Cold War period. And even afterwards, there you see Ricoberto Manchu, uh, who with the uh, collaboration of a, uh, of a European writer, Elizabeth Burgos de Bray, produced this document, I Ricoberto Manchu, which was, is, is arguably the most uh, well-known testimonial ever produced. Uh, but, uh, you know, is this the kind of testimonial that Rigoberto Manchu produced? It's, it's obviously not. There are really significant differences between the, the kind of testimonial that Rigoberto Manchu produced and that uh, Muhammad Shukri produced, but there are also interesting parallels that are worth just sort of pausing and reflecting upon. Now, Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak is uh, one of the most important theorists of post-coloniality. She wrote a very influential essay that's been anthologized many times called Can the Subaltern Speak? And she, you know, she raises this question, you know, if, if you, and what a subaltern would be somebody who is sort of falls below the radar, like akin to what, say, Karl Marx might have called the fourth estate or the lumpen proletariat, the, the poor of the poor, the really, really poor, who are so poor that their stories can't get out because they um, they perhaps are not literate, or if they were to tell their stories, we wouldn't even be in a position to understand them because they would be so significantly uh, different from what we're used to. And so I, I think you know this is a, I'm oversimplifying this a bit, but when with Spivak when she says. Um, when she asked the question, can the subaltern speak? She essentially says, well, no, because if they can speak, they're no longer subaltern. And so but I, I just want you to kind of think about these questions in the back of your mind as you're examining this text. You know, is it a testimonial narrative in the, in the sense of Manchu's text? Is Shukri a, a, a subaltern, a, a speaking subaltern, as Spivak might put it? These are just questions to, to consider. Now, um, I think also I'd like to note that one of the main dramas, and this is akin to say Malcolm X's story too, the autobiography of Malcolm X. You know, Malcolm X didn't learn to, or he didn't. Well, he learned to. Read. He was he could read, but he didn't really start reading, start educating himself until he was imprisoned. And so too did Shukri when he found himself in prison. He really began to. Uh, you know, to, to finally you know, be able to sit still and and learn to read. And, and he he tells us that, that part of what, you know, what's going on here in this story, the drama is the drama of somebody, you know, coming out of a state of illiteracy into literacy, and it's precisely becoming literate that enables him to transform his life or to change his life through uh, having gaining access to literacy. And so the, part of the backdrop here is of this, of, of the drama of this text is the story of a, of a young man who can't read and who can't write and who experiences discrimination 
you know, because of his poverty and because of his illiteracy, but he's able to transform his situation through becoming literate. So I'll just give you a few instances of this. Here's one uh, early incident in the text when a man named Monsieur Sigundi, he says, he pitied me, he said, for not being able to read or write in any language. And he asked me if they did not teach either Arabic or Spanish in Tetuan. He said, well, why didn't you go to school? He asks him. And Shukri says, because my father never thought of sending me. And so he, he begins to become aware that he's he's regarded in the eyes of some as a somebody that is just to be pitied because he's illiterate and this this causes him to think about his situation he says, and then and there's another case this comes later in the novel a secret policeman entered and began to speak in french and spanish with the photographer who was a moroccan when the work was finished the photographer ran his eyes over the paper and asked me if i knew how to sign it what to sign his name i said no most of them are like that said the policeman I, and he says, I wondered what they had written about me on this piece of paper. They can write whatever they want, since I have no idea what the ink marks mean. Nor do I dare to ask them to bring someone who will read it to me before I sign it. And so his, he, he becomes aware not only that his illiteracy causes him to be viewed in a different way by others, but that also... Uh, you know, that, that he, he's in a particularly disempowered situation because of his illiteracy and, you know, the, the, the fact that he can be described in any way that those who are writing about him see fit. And this causes him to want to learn himself, to take, you know, the power into his own hands and learn to read and write as well. So I think this also tells us something about why Muhammad Shukri is so attuned to the dynamics between Bowles and Mabret when Bowles, uh, you know, allegedly destroyed these tapes of Mabret. You know, why, why, why did he do that? Well, so these these dynamics are always, you know, present, and Mabret is 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 acutely sensitive to them. He says he tells us I was shut into a room, and this is when he was in prison. We're finding when he's. Uh, after his roamings and when he's finally able to begin to uh, liberate himself from his state of illiteracy, he says, but I am not used to sol uh, solitude. Uh, Zalkai took a small pencil and set to work writing on the wall. What are you writing? I asked him. I'm writing two lines of a poem. And here's the poem. If someday the people decide to live, fate must bend to that desire. There will be no more night when the chains have broken. Do you understand? And Shukri says, no, but it's magnificent. What does it mean? He's talking about the desire to live. And then Shukri says, you're lucky, I said to Zalkai, because you know how to read and write. He stepped away from the wall and said, someday I'll teach you to read and write. You could learn easily. So this is the situation. This comes at the, towards the conclusion of the novel when he's, when he's finally uh, in a position where he can free himself from illiteracy. Now let's, let's compare this for a moment. This is the opening uh, first paragraph and the line thereafter of Rika Burdum and Chu's narrative. Very famous opening line. You know, she went, later went on to win the Nobel Prize. He says, my name is Rika Burdum and Chu. I'm 23 years old. This is my testimony. I didn't learn it from a book and I didn't learn it alone. I'd like to stress that it's not only my life. It's also the testimony of my people. It's hard for me to remember everything that's happened to me in my life since there have been many bad times, but yes, moments of joy as well. The important thing is that what has happened to me has happened to many other people too. My story is the story of all poor Guatemalans. My personal experience is the reality of a whole people. I must stay, I must say before I start that I never went to school, and so I find it speaking Spanish very difficult. Now, so she tells her story in Spanish. She tells it to uh, educated, inter, you know, European interlocutors, and they produce the text. And it, I think it's, you know, we can certainly ask the question the extent to which her interlocutors also intervened and framed this narrative in, in a particular way that her that Rika Berman Chu's readers would want to know by making it, let's say, conform to the conventions, the generic conventions of the testimonial. 
So uh, unlike Ricoberta Minshew, perhaps um, Muhammad Shukri has a bit more agency in the sense that he is not illiterate. He, he is able to write his own story, but there, but he, he too didn't learn it from a book. He went through many very difficult experiences. Uh, he doesn't explicitly, it's not a say an allegorical eye or a collective eye in, in the very explicit way that it's articulated in Rika Burr Minshew, that she's telling not just her story, but the story of all poor Guatemalans. And therefore, her personal experience is the reality of the whole people. There, you won't find any passages in Shukri that are that explicit. And yet, in the time of Shukri, as well as today, there are there remain many poor uh, Mor uh, Moroccan people. And I think you know we can uh, safely say that uh, that Shukri is his experience is not some bizarre anomalous idiosyncratic trauma that he underwent that it's that it's an experience that others in his situation have also undergone and, this, and if, it, if it wasn't it wouldn't be such a compelling read this is what makes it important is that he's speaking uh, not just of his own experience but an experience that is all too common for for many today now he does he but one of the reasons why this work is so criticized in Morocco and throughout the Islamic world, more generally speaking, is that he deals with these very unwelcome themes, these, these themes that, that people would prefer to remain, uh, that, that, that uh, Shukri would remain silent about, themes of poverty and starvation, themes of drug and alcohol use, the question of sorcery, which is uh, you know, forbidden and, and very strict interpretations of Islam, say, emanating out of Saudi, Wahhabi interpretations, and emanating out of Saudi, Saudi Arabia, prostitution and rape, homosexuality, spousal and child abuse, the theme of the bad father, the, the bad uh, father is uh, really, uh, Arabic father is, is uh, you know, taboo to discuss. And then the interrelations of sex and violence. So there, there, are, there are a lot of themes that, and this is one of the reasons I think why so many people have found this narrative to be so riveting and compelling. And that's because of Shukri is breaking the silence about questions that, that, that many would have preferred he remained silent about. Now, one of the most important of all, the, the name of the book is For Bread Alone, and this theme of bread is so significant because it's dealing with the sheer difficult fact of poverty and hunger as a, as a, say, as, as a motor of history. How compelled he is simply by his hunger from his very earliest memories, the memory of always being hungry. And uh, this is um, what could be a more universal human theme than hunger, especially if, if your hunger is not satisfied. Now, many uh, people in the West may never have experienced hunger. If you live in the world of McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy's and so on, you know, where people eat a lot of junk food and become obese on junk food, one may never really know what it means to be truly hungry in the way that Shukri was hungry. And so, uh, I think this this has a lot to teach us about you know about the significance of what it, you know if you think of how many people in the world today are dying of hunger and starvation. So he's speaking of this very primal human experience. This is one afternoon I could not stop crying. I was hungry. My mother kept telling me, "Be quiet. Tomorrow we're leaving for Tangier. There's all the bread you'll want there. You won't be crying for bread." anymore once we get to Tangier. Now, we read this passage earlier as well. This is when my father came in, I was sobbing and repeating the word bread over and over, bread, 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 bread. Then he began to slap and kick me. Eat your mother's heart. I felt myself lifted into the air and he went on kicking me until his leg was tired. So it's just really difficult to imagine being, you know, abused in such a way merely because you're, you're crying because you're so hungry for something to eat, for some bread. And he tells us another incident that occurred to him. One could compare this to the incident that Augustine tells in his confessions about how he and his friends stole some fruit from a tree. And this remained with him as a subject of guilt, but, but, 
uh, later the sin that Augustine confesses, but Shukri doesn't confess the sin. It causes him to really reflect upon his situation and the situation of his family. He says, next to our house, there is a small orchard. The big pear tree attracts me to it every day. Early one morning, the owner of the orchard caught me poking a long pole into the tree and shaking the biggest and ripest pears from the branches. He drags me along the ground and I struggle to get free. I gave up hope. I felt the urine begin to run out of me. He made me go into a dark room piled with old furniture. It was the first time I had been shut into a room. I realized that not only those of my own family, but other people as well had power over me. And then I understood that the big sweet pears belonged to the people who had imprisoned me. Why did we come all the way from the Rift Riff Mountain area when others stayed behind in their own country? Why does my father go to prison and my mother go to sell vegetables, leaving me alone with nothing to eat when this man stays at home with his wife? Why can't we have what other people have? So again, unlike Augustine, who reflects upon his, his, his inherent original sinfulness because he takes fruit from the tree that doesn't belong to him, here we have uh, excuse me, Shukri reflecting upon his own family situation as a result of this incident of quote-unquote stealing the fruit from a uh, from from a tree. It really it, it, this is this is the beginning of a process of self realization, self awareness, and awareness of his own idiosyncratic situation and that of his family as well. So if you go to Morocco today, here here is what you see. This is a bread seller. This is the, the kinds of bread that you'd find. This is the bread that he was longing for. That he. He really wanted, he needed to survive. And so this bread, this theme of bread, it, it, it's, it's a, um, you know, it's a motif, a theme, the theme of hunger and the image of bread as a motif is going to recur over and over again throughout this narrative. Now, the most, uh, the most uh, saddening and, uh, you know, perhaps a telling epiphany comes to him when he goes into he, 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 he sees a fisherman, you know, eating some bread and tosses some bread into the water and he goes and, and, and swims to find it. And it, it, it causes him to really gain profound insight into the situation, but also it causes him extreme humiliation. So let's look at this little epiphany or this little anecdote, which leads to an epiphany. He says, the fisherman sat in his boat eating his loaf of bread. He eats it. And I am eating it too as I watch. He leans over the gunwale and I watch him wearily. I watch and watch, thinking that he may throw something away, something I can eat as he is eating. Well, here we can, you know, talk about, let's say, the, you know, the politics of starvation. You know, it can, it can, can, it's difficult to imagine if you've always had food whenever you wanted, what, what it must feel like to be in this situation. Is at last he, the fisherman, threw the bread in the water. I stripped off my shirt and trousers and plunged into the water. I swam beneath the bread and saw that the slab of meat that had been inside it had already sunk to the bottom. There goes my luck, I thought. The fisherman began to laugh uproariously. I raised my head towards him, my hand clutching the bread. I looked at him and at the bitten piece of bread. Lumps of shit floated all around me in the water, floating, floating. I seized the bread in my hand. It was spongy and sticky with oil from the boat. In my mind, they became connected, bread and shit, connected. On my way, I looked behind me and the fisherman waving at me, laughing. The fisherman called after me, wheedling. Hey, boy, come here. It's only a joke. Come here. Come on. Here's another loaf of bread. Poor kid, said the fisherman in the boat with him. I did not turn around and go back toward them. The humiliation was very great, too great. So it's it's very interesting. If you look at this from, let's say, a philosophical perspective, it's almost, you know, Hegel versus Marx here. You know, it was, of course, Marx that said necessity is the mode of history, scarcity the, you know, the problem of lack, that there's not enough. Bread is another way of saying that. 
uh, at, whereas, you know, Hegel was the one who argued that the mother of history was, you know, the problem of, you know, the desire to be recognized and the experience of, you know, humiliation that leads us to, uh, to want to fight. And so here his humiliation becomes even more, his experience of humiliation is even more profound than his experience of hunger. You know, he, he, he knows what it is now to be hungry and he knows what it is now to be profoundly and deeply humiliated. These are, these are very primordial human experiences. And I think this is one of the reasons why many people have found this text to be so compelling. Now, um, his need for bread as, as, or his, the problem of scarcity, lack, his hunger pushes him into a situation where he even prostitutes himself in order to be able to eat. And uh, in contemporary Moroccan society today, prostitution remains a problem, female and male prostitution alike. And, uh, and he himself becomes a prostitute in order to, uh, to survive. He's driven to prostitution. I mean, you know, most uh, people who become prostitutes become prostitutes because of, again, uh, necessity. It's, I mean, some people choose sex work, but many, particularly in the context of, you know, countries that are impoverished are driven to it through necessity. And, uh, and so this is his situation. So he becomes a prostitute, one might say, for bread alone. And, he, and so here, let's read Shukri's language. He says, from a car, an old man was signaling to me. What does he want? I went over to the curb and leaned down to the window. He opened the door and said to me in Spanish, get in. I got in and sat down beside him. He stopped the car in a dark section of the road. So the short ride ends here, he reflects. With a caressing movement, he runs his hand over my fly, and the other ride begins. Button by button, he unfastened the trousers, and my sex felt the warmth of his breath. And I won't read the whole description, which is quite graphic. But afterwards, he says, we did not say a word to one another as we drove back to the city. He gave me 50 posadas and let me out, a new profession to add to begging and stealing. This is his first experience of being a prostitute. And he says, suddenly I was struck by my conscience. What I had done was no different from what any whore does in the brothel. My upright sex was worth 50 posadas looked at in that light. And so now he, again, uh, you know, he, he experiences this moment of degradation, but, uh, but it causes him to reflect on his own identity in a way that, uh, that is quite profound, really. And, and again, this is one of the reasons why this, this novel is so, uh, you know, uh, censored in the context of the uh, Arab Islamic world, because it deals so frankly with, with social problems that many would rather ignore, even though the social problems do indeed exist. Uh, and he, he reflects, he says, what does it mean to allow a man 60 or 70 years old to suck on me and then give me 50 posadas? There must be answers to these questions, but I don't know them yet. The questions come easily, but I am not sure of the answer to any one of them. I thought the meaning of life was in living it. I know the flavor of the cigarette because I'm smoking it, and it is the same with everything. I smoked with great gusto. And then I threw the, away the cigarette and went to sleep. And so he, he's, he really becomes something of a philosopher on the basis of this experience because, this experience because it, it propels him to ask more questions than just, let's say, the sensual experience of smoking a cigarette or any other sensual experience. He has to ask the question, why? And so he's, he's really propelled into questioning now his own existence, the meaning of his own existence. But like any uh, philosopher, it doesn't mean, you know, the questions are what are more important than the answers. I mean, he's, he doesn't have the answers, but the questions are coming. And what's important is that the process of questioning has, has deepened in this instance. Now, I'm going to quote here, uh, from a letter. I, I took this from a very interesting essay called, uh, by, uh, in Gensi and Nalasaki's Unwanted Literature. It's a really interesting article on this book. I do recommend it if you want to look it up. Uh, and, and so this author 
cited from a, uh, a letter that this, this text, Shukri's text, American University at Cairo is a very prominent uh, institution for students uh, throughout the uh, Egypt, but throughout the Arabic world more generally to go, particularly if they got money. Uh, but so it's it's a it's a it's a well known institution modeled on liberal arts American uh, colleges. Uh, so it's different from let's say the state run institutions in uh, Egypt, Jordan, and elsewhere. Uh, but that so this text, which probably would most likely not be taught in other places, uh, was taught in this institution. But it caused the parents to be very upset. This was in 1998, and they wrote this letter to the school authorities when they said the story, this is uh, Shukri's bread alone, is far from the principles of Arabic literature. He, Shukri, is talking about his dirty life that is of no interest to anybody. We believe that what has been written in some of the chapters is enough to corrupt a whole generation. Please protect our children and the children of the Egyptian and Arab societies from such persons who are attacking the innocence of our new generations. Do not leave the teacher to control and destroy the minds of our children. So we see that he, you know, he has experienced censorship in uh, places because people just, they just don't want to hear what he has to say because it brings to light issues many would prefer that were left in the dark. Uh, now, this incident became so... Uh, uh, heated that the president of Egypt at that time, Hosni Mubarak, had to intervene. And, uh, you know, the minister of education said, Egypt allows free thinking, but rejects violations of its values and traditions. And it saw this text as, uh, as doing so. And one lawmaker uh, said, the book is so filthy that it should only be read in pubs and brothels. So this, this is the kinds of criticisms that Shukri has been greeted with for his frank dealing with these unwelcome themes. But in his uh, defense, what, what he will say, what Shukri will say is this, look, I'm, I may have been illiterate and ignorant, this is in the text itself of For Bread Alone, but you're a liar and I'd rather be what I am than a liar like you. And so his his primary defense comes back to the question, I am, I am telling the truth about my experience and about what is really happening. And a lot of people, you know, as it's often said, the truth is always offensive. You speak the truth, people are going to criticize you. And this is what Shukri is doing. He's speaking the truth. And he says, I, you know, you can say what you want about me, but I'm not a liar like you. I'm telling the truth of what's happening in our society. And that was for, of course, Jean-Paul Sartre, who said the first step towards changing society in a positive way is, is having a clear sighted, you know, uh, understanding of what your situation is. And arguably this is what Shukri is providing his readers with a very clear sighted description of what is actually taking place. And in doing so thereby provides us with an ability to reflect on what, on what kinds of changes really might take place and could take place and need need to take place. Here's some more descriptions of Shukri, wonderful defenses of his own work. He says, I cannot write about the milk of birds, the gentle stranglehold of the angelic beauty, grasps of dew, the cascade of lions, the heavy breast of females. I cannot write with the crystal's paintbrush. For me, writing is a protest, not a parade. It's a wonderful quote. And here's another one. I saw that writing could also be a way to expose, to protest against those who have stolen my childhood, my teenagehood, and a piece of my youthfulness. At that moment, my writing became committed. Very nice. And then he says, there's in the Moroccan society a more conservative faction. Those people who judge my works as depraved. In my books, there's nothing against the regime. I don't talk about politics or religion, but... What annoys the conservative is to notice the conservatives is to notice that I criticize my father. The father is sacred in the Arabic Muslim society. And so the fact that he, you know, tells us very frankly about what it's like to have the kind of father that he had is uh, is itself a, a taboo. To criticize the father is is taboo. And that's that's what he's doing. But his father was 
was quite a monster. Now here's William S. Burroughs, uh, his defense of Shukri, which I think is very interesting. And he says, what he says about Shukri is very similar to what he says about Jack Kerouac. He said, it is my feeling that Shukri's book, and this is in this case on Jean Genet in Tangier, needs no introduction. It is a full length portrait of Jean Genet. Anyone who reads it will see Genet as clearly as I saw him. As I read Shukri's notes, I saw and heard Jean Genet as clearly as if I had been watching a film of him. To achieve such precision simply by reporting what happened and what was said, one must have a rare clarity of vision. Shukri is a writer. So although Burroughs is talking here about his writing on Jean Genet, let's think about this in light of um, For Bread Alone. Let's read this again. To achieve such precision, simply by reporting what happened and what was said, one must have a rare clarity of vision. Shukri is a writer. And this is, this is what he gives to us, a, a reporting of what was actually said in this rare clarity of vision. And indeed, he is a writer. Now, we'll just very briefly focus on the family drama that he describes. And again, I, I, I warn my readers, there's some really difficult passages here. I, I'm not going to be reading the most ugly ones, but I will. Uh, I don't think we can ignore this because this is so profoundly, you know, so profoundly shakes, uh, shapes Shukri. He says, each day or each afternoon, my father comes home disappointed. Not a movement, not a word, save at his command, just as nothing can happen unless it is decreed by Allah. So his father has this godlike power in his home. He hits my mother, bitch, rotten whore. He abuses everyone with his words, sometimes even Allah. My little brother cries as he squirms on the bed. He sobs and calls for bread. I see my father walking towards the bed, a wild light in his eyes. No one can run away from the craziness in his eyes or get out of the way of his octopus hands. Now we know that Shukri's father actually killed his brother, murdered his 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 own son, and yet Muhammad Shukri is is uh, can't say anything about it for fear that he too will be killed by his father. And he says, I thought of how my father had twisted Abdulakar's neck, and I wanted to cry out. He killed him. Yes, he killed him. I saw him kill him. He did it. He killed him. I saw him. He twisted his neck around and the blood ran out of his mouth. I saw it. I saw him kill him. He killed him. And then, you know, that's, that's really a very, uh, very, uh, very difficult passage to focus on, but quite poetically written and quite powerful. And then he says, to, uh, to ease the unbearable hatred I felt for my father, I began to cry. Then I was afraid he was going to kill me too. He began to scold me in a low voice, loaded with menace. Stop that. You've cried enough at home. Well, uh, these are, these are you know, can you imagine as a child having lived through this experience? Well, this profoundly affects him, but he's, again, he's speaking the unspeakable. He couldn't speak it at the time that it happened. His father was never even prosecuted for this. Uh, but as, as, as a writer and, and an adult, he is able to, to articulate and to speak the truth of what happened to him. And uh, the fact that this, that one would want to censor this, I think it tells us a great deal about, the, uh, it tells us a lot more about the society that wants to censor than it does about Shukri himself. It says, in the afternoon, my father came back dejected, giving off a smell of wine. I heard my mother say, you've been drinking, haven't you? I woke up in the night with the full bladder. The sound of kisses, like the clapping of hands, hard breathing, tender murmurs. They like each other. I hate their love. Flesh clapping. Poof. She tells lies. I'll never believe her. This is her, his mother. Again, no, no, hurts. Like this, like this. That's better. No, no, like this. Yes, that's right. Breathing, kisses, groans, breathing, kisses, groans. They're biting each other. They're devouring one another, licking each other's blood. He stabbed her. A long, soft moan. He killed her. I feel my bladder emptying itself. The warm liquid running between my thighs feels good. So obviously his parents are having sex, but he's, you know, he doesn't, he, imagine, you know, the father had just killed his brother and now he sees his, 
here he overhears his parents having sex and it, it causes such confusion and ambivalence in him as a child he's having a really difficult time processing this but it remains with him throughout his life this kind of ambivalence i think what's interesting too is the way again the interrelations of sex and violence here the way that he describes him and then the way that later he describes how it will affect him as an adult as well he said he tells us quite frankly he says my father's rough treatment of me only served always only ser served only to increase the rage of my desire and and then um here is when he gets into a relationship with uh, this woman later in the narrative towards the latter part of it he reflects about you know his feelings for her which we can see directly related to the situation between his father and mother he says am i myself beginning to fall in love with salafa merely to think of her makes my heart beat harder then i feel a wave of hostility toward her i imagine myself insulting her slapping her trying to work up her temper maybe i like her better angry than calm better sad than happy maybe she means more to me when she's being crazy than when she is sensible. Thus, I learn a new truth about my feelings for Salaf, which are, of course, linked very clearly to the situation that he experienced as a child. So there's, there's a lot that we can learn here by studying the way in which he describes these relationships. Now, coming to the end of this uh, lecture, here's a picture of Burroughs and uh, there with the camera on the right and Bowles in between. I think that's Gregory Corso, very well-known American poet uh, with his eyes closed there next to Bowles with the cigarette in his mouth. And so much of what we, when we think about Tangier today, particularly as American uh, readers, you know, we, we, we can't escape you know, Bowles and Burroughs, they were so, they lived there for so long and they were so influential. But here I want to read, in concluding, I want to read to you a passage from uh, from Shukri on Bowles and on Bowles in Tangier, which gives us this from the Moroccan experience rather than the American experience. And Shukri says, many Westerners and Americans say that Tangier without Paul Bowles wouldn't be Tangier. But which Tangier are they speaking of? No doubt they refer to the Tangier that had been adored by Bowles and his kind. And obviously, the Tangier of Shukri was very different. When it was chic and life there were inexpensive, a place where money would seek you out without having to look for it. They forget that it was Tangier that created and adopted them, and that precious few of them did anything to enhance its literary and cultural reputation. They forget that it is the environment first of all, that nurtures the artists and that that it nurtures will only come to nourish it in turn if they are exceptionally gifted, true artists, in other words. So there's, there's Shukri's response to that. And I think it's an important response to bear in mind. So he's, he's a really interesting figure. I do uh, urge you to, if you haven't already read this novel, I'd urge you to read it. It has a soul, it has a lot to learn. We have a lot to learn from it. And also Mohammed Mabret's, uh, the translations that Bowles did of him are also very interesting among many other works produced by Bowles at this time.